Hello, Curran here. This video is all about the margin convention of D3.js and how we can make a responsive margin and also how we can generalize this and make it a reusable piece of code. But first of all, why would you want to make a margin anyway? Let's take a look at this example line chart that shows temperature over time. If I set the left margin to zero, and then I set the right margin to zero, and the top margin gets set to zero, and the bottom margin also gets set to zero, then there's no room for the axes and the labels and the tick marks and stuff. So I'd say that's the main reason that we want to use a margin, is so we can make space for our axes, tick marks, and the axis labels. All right, now I'll bring back the bottom, top, right, and left margins. See, now we can see the tick marks and the axis labels. What I'm going to do next is take this responsive starter code that was created in a previous video, fork it, and then implement the margin convention within this code. From within this page, I'm going to click on fork. And I'll call it responsive margin convention. And I'll add with margins to the end of that description. Before we dive in, I want to just take a quick look at this canonical margin convention example uh, by Mike Bostock on blocks.org. This is a nice visual representation of the concept of the margin convention. That is that you, t you have a group element that gets translated by margin.left and margin.top. And by the way, margin is just going to be a JavaScript object that has numerical values for bottom, top, left, and right. If we inspect the DOM here, we can see that there's this group element here that gets translated by 60 pixels to the right and 60 pixels down. An SVG group element is kind of a container, like a box, that you can put other things into. And if you translate it as in move it around, then everything inside of it also moves. In here, we can see there's a rectangle that has width 800 and height 340. This is the inner rectangle that uses the inner width and inner height, which is computed by taking the outer width and the outer height and subtracting the margin values, which, is, which are represented by these arrows here. All right, let's dive into this code here. We'll begin by having our responsive component accept a new prop called margin. And then when we invoke this responsive component, we can pass in a margin property that is just a JavaScript object with properties top, bottom, left, and right, all set to 20. Before we go any further, I'm going to adjust the code a little bit to establish some conventions. The first of which is, I'd like the code to read like a book. So there's like the table of contents and then all the details. This logic that deals with the render function is sort of like the table of contents of a book. So I'll group it together and then move it to the top of the file. Now when you approach this, it's clear that, okay, the first thing that happens is the render function gets invoked, and also it gets invoked every time the page resizes. Then when you read through the render function, you can see, oh, it invokes this my responsive component, and the details of that follow. So getting back on track, now we have this margin prop passed in. What do we do next? We can use the same pattern as we used with the SVG element, namely svg.selectallg.data, an array with a single element. And then on the enter selection, we append a new group element. And then we merge that with the update selection and reassign that to our variable g. Now, instead of appending our rectangle to SVG, we want to append it to G instead. Let's see, is this still working? All right, yeah, it's still working. I'm going to rearrange my environment here so the code is on the left and the visualization is on the right. What we want to do next 
is take this group element and then translate it by the margin left and top. So we can say dot attr transform translate by margin dot left and margin dot top. All right, so see what happened here. Our rectangle got moved down and to the right. And notice if we get rid of the first argument, if we say, okay, the x translate is zero, then it doesn't get moved over in the x direction. And if we set the y translate to be zero, then it doesn't get moved down in the y direction. All right, we've translated our group element, but there is sort of a loose end we need to tie up. See how now our rectangle goes off the edge of the screen? This is because we're still using the width and height on our rectangle, but we really should compute the inner width and inner height based on the margin. So let's say const inner width equals width, which is the outer width, minus margin dot left minus margin dot right, because left and right is what subtracts from the width. Then we can use this inner width for the width of our rectangle. Now there's some space to the right of our rectangle, see that? Similarly, we can say inner height is the outer height minus margin dot top minus margin dot bottom. And then use that inner height for the height of our rectangle. Now you can see that there's some space on the bottom of our rectangle here. And let's just check, if we resize the screen, does it update? Yeah, it looks like. Looks like it's fine, it's quite responsive. All right, now you know how to make a responsive version of the D3 margin convention. But I wanna take it one step further because on just about every visualization, you know, scatter plot, bar chart, line chart, they all need the margin. And this is the most uh, copy pasted bit of code that I've ever seen. So let's uh, encapsulate the margin convention into a function. Then we can use it in a bunch of other visualizations in the future. We won't need to keep writing it over and over and over again. All right, so I'm gonna take this code, which is the logic of the margin convention, cut it, make a new function. I'll call it margin convention. And then paste that code right into here. In this code here, what do we need from the margin convention? We need g, we need inner width, and we need inner height. So let's say, const g inner width inner height equals margin convention. But what does margin convention need? It needs the SVG and it needs the margin. Let's follow the same pattern that we use for my responsive component. Namely, the first argument is a selection with the containing element and the second argument is a props object. Now that I think of it, for consistency, the, really the first argument should be called selection. So I'm just gonna rename that to selection and then use selection in here instead. So we can use the same signature for the margin convention. And when we invoke the margin convention, we can say, okay, the selection is SVG and the props are, well, let's pass in margin. By the way, this is ES6 syntax. It means the same thing as this. So down in our margin convention function, instead of SVG, let's use selection there. And we can unpack the props and say const curly brace margin equals props. Finally, the calling code is expecting this function to return an object with G inner width and inner height. So let's make our margin convention return that object. 
let's see, what's the problem here? Aha, width is not defined, right. So we need to pass in width and height as well from the props. So we can use the same expression to unpack width, height, and margin. And we can pass in as the props here width, height, and margin. All right, that's one way that we can encapsulate the margin convention as a function that we can reuse over and over again rather than copy pasting the code. But you know what? If someone were to fork this right now, that would effectively be copy pasting this code. To avoid this situation where code gets copied and copied and copied, Davis Tech, the platform, has a feature called technology documents. See up here in the create menu, I could create a data set, a visualization, or a technology. A technology, and maybe it's sort of a funny name, but it's basically a JavaScript chunk of code, a JavaScript file. And it's designed to be not as heavyweight as creating your own um, NPM module, like a proper JavaScript productionized library. It's somewhere in between an NPM module and like an example on blocks.org. Uh, the purpose of this is to reduce duplication across visualizations. So let's create a technology for this margin convention function. That way, when this responsive margin convention visualization gets forked, that code won't get copy-pasted, but instead the reference to this technology is what will be copied, not the actual implementation of it. All right, so I'm going to click on Create Technology, but I'll do it in a new tab so that I keep this one open. So I'll create a new technology. I'll call it the Margin Convention, and then I'll click on Create. And I'll describe it as a reusable implementation of the d3.js margin convention, and then paste a link to that original piece on blocks.org. Then I'll go over to our responsive margin convention uh, working piece here, and then I'm going to cut this out of here and paste it into here, and then unindent it. And that's it. We have created a new technology that we can reference from within our visualization. Let's do that next. So over in our visualization, clean up the spacing, and then under this references section, I'm going to click on add. The file name here is how we can refer to this technology from within this visualization only. So I'll say marginconvention.js. And the document ID, it, it refers to actually this ID that's used for this document. But you can search for it by typing margin. And then I can click on the margin convention, which resolves to that document ID. Now I can click Add Reference. And boom, it's there as marginconvention.js. And see, if I click on this document ID here, it loads up the margin convention page, the edit page for this. So I can copy this file name. And then in the code here, I'll say, all right, script tag, the source is marginconvention.js. And lo and behold, boom, it works. And by the way, now if I go back to this edit page for the margin convention code, if I make a change over here, the changes propagate immediately to all visualizations that reference this technology. And if you go to the View page for a technology, you can see the listing of all visualizations that use it. You know, there is a slight problem with this that I'd like to correct, and that is in that we say dot select all G. If we take a look at an actual 
more real world example with axes and we inspect the DOM here, we can see that within our group element, there are in fact more group elements, like for example for axes. And even inside of one axis, there's a lot more group elements. So if we've got a scenario where there's group elements inside of this group element, then when we say dot select all G, it's actually going to go ahead and select all G, you know, all of these group elements, which is not what we want. So what can we do here? How can we solve this? I propose we use classes. We use a class for our margin group, maybe margin dash group, and then we can select on that class. So we just specifically select that one group element that we created before. All right, so instead of saying select all G, I'm going to say select all dot to select a class, margin dash group. Then in our enter selection, we can give it a class of margin dash group. But wait a minute, you may say, that's not really a part of the margin convention. And like, what if I'm using this library or technology and I want to use a different class name, then what? Well, that's a good point, actually. I mean, uh, why don't we make the class name configurable? Instead of saying dot select all margin dash group, we can say dot select all dot plus class name. And when we're setting the class, we can use class name instead of margin group. And while we're unpacking our props, we can unpack class name as well. We can even use this fancy schmancy ES6 syntax to say that if class name is not provided on the props, use the default value of margin dash group. That way, if you do specify class name in the props, then the specified value will be used. But if not, as in the case of our existing code here, then the class name margin dash group will be used. This completes our implementation of this margin convention technology. And now when you use it, it will not select all of the group elements inside your margin group, but it will only select that one that we want to select. All right, that's how you can create a reusable implementation of the D3.js margin convention. Hopefully this uh, work and this video will be the foundation for making a lot of actual visualizations in the future. So thanks for watching. Take care.